Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you this morning to the IIANA webinar. And we're delighted to be joined this morning by Dr. Andrea Amon, Director of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, who has been generous enough to take time out of a very busy schedule to speak to us this morning. And Dr. Amon will speak for about 20 minutes uh, on the topic strengthening crisis preparedness and response to disease threats and outbreaks. And after uh, the presentation, we will go to question and answer. And you will be able to join the question and answer function um, on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session and as they occur to you. And we will pass them to Dr. Amon when she has finished her presentation. Um, we would be uh, happy if you could identify yourself and your affiliation as you ask your question. And just a reminder that today's presentation and the question and answer are both on the record. And please do feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, at IIEA. Uh, just some background on the European Agency. Uh, it was founded 15 years ago in the aftermath of the SARS pandemic. And it is the EU agency uh, armed, aimed at strengthening Europe's defences against infectious diseases. And of course, the challenges of the COVID pandemic have prompted an increased level of cooperation and uh, coordination at EU level. And the ECDC has been very supportive of EU member states and the EU Commission throughout the COVID pandemic by providing the scientific background necessary to help member states to take the complex decisions in these uh, unprecedented times. And um, Dr. Andre Amon will outline the role of the agency in her address um, uh, as an agency responding to the pandemic for the EU. And she will also discuss the developments in surveillance preparedness and international cooperation uh, in the context of an enhanced role for the ECDC. But now to uh, introduce formally uh, Dr. Amon. Uh, Dr. Amon was appointed director of the ECDC in June 2017, and prior to this, she was deputy director and head of unit for resource management and coordination, as well as acting director. And prior to joining uh, the agency, Dr. Amon uh, served in several roles at the Robert Cook Institute in Berlin, uh, most recently as head of department for infectious disease epidemiology. And in this capacity, she maintained and further developed the German national surveillance system, coordinated the national outbreak response team for current and emerging infections, and coordinated emergency planning for influenza, and directed the field epidemiology training program, and coordinated research programs in infectious diseases, and provided scientific advice for government, members of parliament, and the public. Well, with that lengthy list of wonderful experiences for the post, uh, may I hand over the floor to you, Dr. Amand, and we are, um, wait eagerly to hear your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Gross, for the uh, introduction, but also for the invitation. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, that uh, I'm here and can share with you my views um, on the necessary developments and uh, um, in surveillance preparedness and international cooperation and uh, also uh, the experience that we had. Before I go to the three areas, I would like to give a short uh, summary of what uh, um, we did in the past 15 months. Um, because, I mean, we have all seen that the COVID-19 pandemic brought suffering, sadness, frustration, and exhaustion at all levels uh, of the society. But it also made very clear that we cannot be complacent when it comes to surveillance, pandemic preparedness, health system capacity, and nourishing international cooperation among, among public health institutions. So in the past 15 months, what we have done is, according to our current mandate, constantly assessed the evolving risk um, and we have standardized data collections through common case definitions, data standards and protocols, uh, and also produced daily uh, epidemiological updates and weekly more in-depth analysis um, by country and for the EU as whole. 
Uh, as a data source, we have used uh, as a, the European surveillance system, short TESI, uh, which is the official database for all the, the surveillance uh, data uh, from where member states report to ECDC. Uh, but we also have used a so-called epidemic intelligence data where we scrape the, the internet from uh, uh, official uh, sources. Um, we have then searched not only for the epidemiological indicators like um, number of cases, hospitalizations, intensive care unit admissions and deaths, but also monitored the ongoing public health uh, measures put in place and changed by member states. We have, with this, uh, all this information, our mathematical modeling uh, to uh, deliver 30 days forecast, uh, taking such measures into account. And since the measures changed so frequently, we were reluctant to have any further forecasts, because then, of course, when the measures change, all the forecasts uh, are rendered um, uh, uh, a bit um, invalid. So we have, in addition, produced numerous guidance documents on all aspects of, um, uh, of COVID, uh, from infection prevention and control in hospitals to various setting recommendations to the use uh, of non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, ACA lockdowns. Uh, now, it, um, the, the difficulty in obtaining data uh, needed to steer the response in an optimal way have really uncovered how inadequate the surveillance systems are uh, for, for such a situation. Um, the quality of the data um, uh, is, of course, relying on the system, health system that it's coming from, and also from the strategy that is employed by a country, how to collect whom to test, um, uh, which kind of surveillance uh, to, to uh, um, uh, establish. And um, here there were initial delays uh, to detect the ongoing community transmissions. And that has um, uh, led to widespread transmission before these containment measures uh, could actually be taken. And that led to the first severe wave in the spring last year. Um, but also uh, the data, the surveillance data that were used, for instance, to um, uh, uh, put uh, travel measures in place, travel restrictions were not really comparable between the countries. And so uh, based on non-comparable data, quite far reaching um, um, uh, decisions have been made. And that is what uh, we were observing and we thought, well, it's, we, would, we will need to change, have to change that. Now, recently, we saw that with the uh, occurrence of the variants, uh, uh, which are only detectable when you do really whole genome sequencing, uh, there is also a lack of uh, capability and capacity in the countries. And um, we also um, missed the capacity to do uh, accompanying studies this time on, for instance, uh, the transmissibility uh, by in certain contexts, uh, risk factors for reinfection and these kind of things. These studies are, of course, done, but uh, not uh, in the systematic way that we would like to have uh, or would like to see. Now, um, in view of these weaknesses, the European Commission and many member states have called for a stronger role. Um, and uh, in, 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 of, of ECDC in coordinating and standardizing uh, EU surveillance and enhancing preparedness. So these proposals that the Commission has put forward in um, November last year are now under discussion um, at uh, EU levels by the Council and by the European Parliament mainly. Uh, there are other consultations also ongoing. Now, um, when I go now a bit more to the surveillance aspect, uh, 
the Co European Commission has provided ECDC now with um, for this year already with additional financial and and um, uh, human resources and um, uh, is also starting this initiative of the European Health which uh, is uh, basically um, uh, should facilitate and regulate the uh, secondary use of electronic health um, records. Now, um, uh, you also may be aware that as uh, preparation for the, the new agency that will, where the legal proposal is in preparation, the European um, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, uh, there is sort of a preparatory uh, uh, work uh, has been initiated uh, that should um, really uh, secure resources to tackle the variants. And here we um, uh, have, uh, have been and will be given um, a, a quite a large, actually exceeding our total annual budget by almost half. Um, uh, additional uh, resources to strengthen member states whole genome sequencing capacities. And uh, so we are now uh, planning this together with the countries to not only secure the current uh, immediate support, but also the long term capacity building in the countries in terms of technology, just buying the machine and in um, uh, skill development, because you need trained uh, and educated uh, people for interpreting what these machines produce. Now, um, uh, this, the modernization of these uh, surveillance systems will require a, a significant change in the mindset uh, and in the overall prioritization of resources for public health. Um, and I will explain this a bit. So our uh, intention is uh, two pronged. We want to work with the member states uh, to uh, propose methods and standards that are uh, valuable and applicable for all member states. But at the same time, also work with individual member states to address their um, um, uh, uh, improvement needs specifically. So it will be a general and a specific uh, work that we will do. And uh, for that uh, in, uh, to do, there is no way around other than really embrace the a huge potential of digitalization. Um, and also agree on key surveillance objectives and suitable methods how we can actually achieve them. Now, right now, most of the surveillance is relying on the traditional technologies. Um, uh, so the um, uh, current development of digitalization uh, in health is looking more at health care and public health has never been prioritized so far. It was public health was basically not included. Um, so the, the main technologies that uh, we think we can, uh, we can harvest here and harness here is the secondary use of electronic health records data. So, and these are of course in development and uh, also in use in, in, in several countries, but they're not sufficiently standardized. Uh, for for the data to be uh, uh, routinely used. So we need in the EU a clear governance uh, for the secondary use of this data, which is sort of in the make, and a rigorous validation process to ensure uh, the quality uh, data and make use uh, that uh, the um, data are acceptable and compliant with the data protection regulation. Um, which is uh, not an easy issue. So, um, but uh, there's another element that also the pandemic showed is that the future surveillance will um, be dependent on our ability to engage the population uh, in this task and exploit new technologies in a way so that the citizens 
have the feeling they get the support they need uh, while trusting that their data are protected and used for their own benefit. Um, and I I'm, I'm, uh, want to use here as an example the apps, the contact tracing apps. Um, and um, we are, um, um, uh, uh, we will work with the member states on developing uh, such apps um, for syndromic surveillance. So meaning not specific diseases, but syndromes that could mean a lot of diseases like fever, uh, acute respiratory infections, uh, and so forth. To rapidly detect then outbreaks and uh, of community transmission. But for that, we need a good uh, confidence and uh, trust of the population because we have all seen that these uh, um, contact tracing apps never took off because of the, the, the low trust and take up in the population. So um, uh, that's uh, basically uh, our, our idea for the future surveillance is more digital and more participative. Now, when we go to pandemic preparedness, pandemics are by definition having an impact on the whole world. That's sort of um, in inherent. And the uh, proposals for the expanded mandate um, uh, of ECDC entail a number of uh, suggestions how the pre preparedness um, um, uh, can be uh, improved and how the existing union structures and mechanisms can be enhanced. Now, um, after, uh, well, 2003, the SARS um, uh, uh, outbreak, uh, I mean, all member states have uh, developed pandemic preparedness plans, essentially mainly for influenza. And in Spring 2009, when there was the um, avian, uh, not uh, the, the um, uh, H1N1 uh, influenza pandemic, um, that also led to many member states updating and, and um, uh, revising their plans. So retrospectively, unfortunately, this pandemic was very mild. And countries thought, well, our plans, uh, we could cope with this. It's, it's actually quite fine. Um, so in 2013, based on these experiences, um, there was a new legal framework for, put forward to combat cross-border health threats. Um, and um, uh, according to this uh, legal framework, the member states had to report every three years on the pandemic preparedness status of their countries. And um, now, what we have seen is that, uh, and of course, in theory, we knew is that having such a preparedness plan is good and is necessary, but it's only the first step. And you can't got, sort of stop at that. Um, during an emergency, it's, the, it's most relevant how quickly these plans can be put into action um, and into efficient and sometimes also flexible measures. Um, and that is sort of part of a whole preparedness cycle where you have the preparedness, then you either test in, in a practical example right now or in simulation exercises, and then you learn lessons and take measures for improving. So that's a whole cycle that needs to go on permanently. Um, but the first stage is really to understand the emerging threat landscape. So what are we actually looking at? Uh, identify and map vulnerabilities and capacity gaps, and then work to address these. Then you do the testing, simulation exercises, stress tests, and you learn what, uh, where there are still weaknesses and start improving them. And so ideally, you have an upward spiral here. Now, um, we have, um, uh, there is, of course, uh, all kinds of uh, evaluation tools and assessment tools. Uh, and one is, for instance, uh, from WHO, the Joint External Evaluation Assessments, where we have joined those missions to EU member states. 
um, and that is looking at the whole uh, the whole uh, setup. But um, although so these protocols will need to be in the light of the experience that we have right now. So our idea is, and we have already published uh, um, uh, documents for in action and after action reviews that the countries either do themselves or with support either from us or, or, or from um, uh, from other um, institutions. And these should be a routine component of the preparedness. So whenever there is an outbreak, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a big pandemic. It can be a local outbreak. Learn the lessons and try to um, work in these, um, these uh, uh, lessons in improving the weaknesses. So uh, we want to come uh, that member to a point where member states really systematically learn from all these outbreaks. Now, uh, one um, aspect um, of uh, the proposal for, for, for um, um, extending the ECDC mandate is actually the establishment of an EU health task force. Uh, to facilitate the, uh, the, the support for quick outbreak response in the EU, but also outside of the EU. And to ensure and strengthen the needed capacities and capability to force the collaboration between stakeholders. There are other elements as well, like uh, that ECDC should be able to provide non-binding recommendations for risk management, which right now is a big no-no for us. We can't enter risk management. We can only give options for response. Um, that uh, we uh, monitor and assess not only sort of the little tiny part of the health system related to infectious diseases, but also health system related indicators. Like for instance, uh, the, the um, um, bed capacity, the uh, workforce capacity and so forth. Um, and that we also um, uh, go better about defining um, specific population groups at risk and um, can then also devise uh, targeted uh, prevention and response measures. So um, uh, I think a very important um, weakness that showed uh, here in, in the past month is also the interoperability of the plans with the neighboring countries. Because I mean, uh, especially for the border regions, um, it was sometimes really people were caught on the side of the border because of measures implementing um, uh, on of, of one side. So here, really, um, um, uh, that, uh, some consideration have to has to be given. Um, and the other element that needs to be implemented in the preparedness plans is the community engagement. Because what we're seeing right now with the pandemic fatigue is also a failure to engage the communities in a, in a, in a way that they see the necessity why they still have to follow all these measures. So coming now to the international cooperation. Uh, we have, since the beginning of our, our center, uh, been closely working with the EU EEA member states and the EU institutions, as well as international partners. But our focus is always on the EU. And um, so um, we have uh, seen now that uh, in the pandemic, it's hugely important to have a strong international cooperation and coordination with partners for sharing data uh, and in particular for sharing knowledge because you know the pandemic started in uh, in Asia and then it came to us so by the time we were dealing with the first wave uh, the Asian countries were already sort of recovering from their first wave so we had contact actually with Singapore um, uh, South Korea uh, and Japan and China, so also so to learn how they managed and uh, take these, um, these, this, uh, this experience also into, into our guidance here. Now, um, 
we we have um, uh, this year starting a new seven year strategy where we have five objectives and one is exclusively dedicated to um, um, uh, increasing the health security in the EU through international collaboration and alignment. And of course, the first well area where we look at is our neighboring countries. Uh, so that means the Western Balkans and Turkey, where we have been working already, I think, in the last 10 years, bringing them um, uh, closer to the EU standards, gradually integrating them into our activities um, and um, uh, assisting them to strengthen surveillance, preparedness and response capacities. So then the next... Um, ring would be the European neighborhood policy partner countries, where which is essentially the countries surrounding the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And we have, uh, with funding from the engineer, um, now a, um, uh, a program for um, health security for the next four years. And the aim is to have a tailor-made support for those countries to strengthen their public health systems um, uh, and um, uh, build also workforce oriented capacity. Now, we work very closely with WHO, especially the European office. Um, and uh, that has uh, developed over the last 15 years and intensified last year immensely. Um, so we try to align the, the, the guidance as much as, as, as possible. Uh, since last year, we have also intensified our collaboration with the Africa CDC that is, has a responsibility for all of um, uh, Africa. And also here we have from DG INTPA a, um, a considerable uh, gra uh, grant to uh, strengthen the um, capabilities of the Africa CDC in terms of harmonized surveillance across the African continent, data sharing, early detection of threats, preparedness, and capacity building. And then is the wider world where we have already since years an ongoing collaboration with other centers for disease prevention and control, um, uh, like in the US, in China, in Canada, Israel, and as I mentioned, Africa recently. But now we have um, um, made new connections. As I mentioned, Singapore, South Korea, but also Mexico and the Caribbean. So, uh, and, and that uh, uh, group we have convened on a regular basis um, and it uh, has been uh, uh, has proven uh, to be very, very um, uh, useful for us. So uh, I see the clear potential for us to um, uh, support crisis response in Europe, but also um, um, uh, in uh, outside and also uh, reap the benefits of working internationally for enhancing uh, the EU health security. So in that sense, we, we really um, support uh, to um, uh, enforce our mandate. So I have now a few take home messages. Um, we have seen that we are even more connected than we thought globally. An infectious disease anywhere in the world can be around the globe and arrive here in Europe within 24 to 48 hours. In infectious diseases, nothing on this earth is remote. All is close to home. Uh, then we have also seen that disruptions in movement of goods and people have really far reaching consequences. So we should do our utmost to avoid that. I mean, avoiding it, not in saying, well, we don't take these measures if it's necessary, but really avoid making them necessary. So uh, detecting uh, um, uh, outbreaks early and, and having, having strong measures also very early. Uh, WHO and ECDC, along with other international organizations, have a crucial role in the global health security. 
health security architecture and it is important to capitalize on each other's uh, experience in several uh, specific area now i think it became clear that strengthening and maintaining preparedness um, nationally and internationally is an investment and not as a not a cost as it's seen mostly um, and lastly we have also seen that no country can cope with such a crisis alone and not even one region only if we are prepared together we are also safe together thank you and i'm looking forward to the questions thank you very much indeed dr amon that was really wide ranging and um uh, I think you touched on so many areas and so many important points. I'm not sure there are any questions left, but indeed, indeed there are. Um, so uh, just to go to the questions uh, now, and um, I have one uh, of my own. I'm uh, exercising the uh, privilege of chairman, but also uh, merging it with one from um, retired army officer, B Brigadier General Ahern. My question is, why was the spread uh, of COVID so universal, unlike SARS and Ebola, which were contained? Uh, that, that is the, the question I had. And um, uh, Jera Hearn's question is, there is a mindset in uh, Asia that is used to dealing with pandemics. Is that a factor uh, when you consider how uh, they have been uh, dealt with in Asia as opposed to in, say, Western Europe, where you were stressing the need to get the population engaged? The population in Asia seems to be more attuned and prepared for pandemics. But firstly, why was it not contained like the previous ones and the Asian mentality? Is that a factor that we should look more closely at? Okay, I come to the first question, the, the universal spread. <clears throat> this has to do with the, un with the characteristics of this virus. Um, uh, the Ebola is uh, not transmitted uh, via respiratory um, uh, infections. It's transmitted through blood. Um, and and uh, um, uh, also the, the SARS virus in 2003 had different, um, uh, different um, uh, characteristics of transmissibility than this one. And uh, I think at the beginning, when we didn't know much about this virus, we always tried to do analogies to the other SARS virus that we have heard about, uh, about uh, and that we have actually, I have been dealing with also. Um, but it was wrong uh, because at the beginning it was said it's only transmissible from animals to humans. But then it turned out very quickly, it's also transmissible from human to human. And what really made the transmission so, um, so widespread is the fact that even someone with no symptoms can infect someone else. And that makes it uh, quite a very, very difficult um, virus to control. So, um, and as for the mindset, um, it's, it's true. I mean, in, in Asia, Asia was uh, also from the first SARS virus much more heavily affected than we were. I mean, we had a few hospital uh, uh, clusters in, in Europe, but basically uh, the first SARS um, uh, outbreak didn't um, really affect Europe. Uh, so we, 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 we had, we, we didn't have this, um, this um, uh, experience. So, um, uh, and ever since this first uh, SARS outbreak, the, in Asia, the, the use of masks was uh, widely, widespread. Whereas in Europe, it's still, in some of the countries, it's still very difficult. Uh, when you go out with a mask, uh, you are really looked at like an alien. Um, and in other countries, it has become more normal now as well. So there is, of course, um, also, of, co of course, how the society is organized. 
uh, makes uh, makes makes um, uh, a difference. But I think for 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 our um, uh, uh, populations <laughs> to cope with something that restricts their uh, daily freedom was very very difficult to 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 cope with. Yes, yes, yes. That, and that still is. Yes, that that is true, and the, and we see that in the various countries. I have a question, Dr. Aman, from Elizabeth Harding, he, who is EUK Consulting, and she asks: um, To what extent will the ECDC's threat assessment capacity develop under new legislation to expand its mandate? And what about vis-à-vis uh, -vis the new HERA? Now you may know what that means, but I'm afraid I don't. Yeah, this uh, HERA is the <clears throat> is this new agency that uh, is in um, in the making right now um, and um, we don't know exactly how it will look like uh, we are ensured that this will not overlap with our activities and the threat assessment capacity that we have um, is actually depending on um, uh, how how uh, on uh, on the quality of the data that we can collect and how quickly we can collect those. And there is, um, of course, a facilitation through also electronic and digitalized uh, um, uh, methods. Um, uh, we are considering looking into how far we can also use um, machine learning for you know, collecting all this data. Um, and so increase uh, the, um, let's say, decrease the human input in the scraping of the data and um, uh, put this more to the analysis uh, of, of, of the data. And we are in the process of using the additional human resources that we get of also getting more um, modeling capacity. Thank you. Um, another question I have is, is an environmental one, in fact, that uh, touches obviously on aspects of, of pandemics. And it's from Emily uh, Binchy, who is a researcher in the Institute. And she asks that in terms of assessing emerging threats, um, uh, Mike Ryan uh, of the WHO recently outlined the need to ensure protection of the environment and biodiversity. And is this something the ECDC is looking at as a weakness which could result in future pandemics? And of course, climate change, uh, which is another question, uh, will come into this. Is this an aspect that the ECDC looks at or considers in terms of future pandemics? I mean, um, we will certainly work together with those institutions that look into this, but we don't uh, right now consider this as a uh, focus area for ourselves. Uh, because I mean, uh, although we have now a bit more resources, we still only have 311 people. Um, uh, and I mean, um, we focus on the human health aspects knowing that they are influenced by uh, the interaction with animals and the environment. But um, I think our capacities to cover those areas ourselves is, is limited. So I would rather expand our collaborations in this area. And definitely climate change is something we are already working on in a way of um, looking at the impact of rising temperatures uh, for um, the sort of um, potpourri of infectious diseases. And there we have in particular uh, under our radar, the vector-borne diseases, where we see already for certain vector-borne diseases a northward extension by year. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, another question from James McGing. You mentioned the um, maintaining popular support, which I think has, every government has felt uh, this is absolutely necessary uh, for, um, uh, for containing the disease, but also for the acceptance of the vaccines. Uh, so uh, James McGing asks, given the signs of COVID fatigue visible in many EU countries, could you suggest how um, uh, EU governments could improve their approach to maintaining popular support. Uh, in other words, uh, Dr. Arman, have you seen any, any techniques or approaches that have worked better in some countries than in others to 
to get the the um, acquiescence and uh, agreement of the population? I mean, um, uh, the 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 basis for all of uh, for for the support of the population is the trust of the population into the government, and that is. There is a vast variation in this uh, in the in the EU countries, but when this is there, um, and of course it's also a matter of um, um, increasing the trust and uh, maintaining the trust. But um, uh, we have seen that uh, in countries where the, the government was very frank, open, um, uh, 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 transparent, and unified in the messaging. Uh, that that helps. Um, and I mean, uh, techniques are, for instance, to, to engage certain community leaders. That's, of course, uh, uh, most important for specific communities, marginalized communities, but also in the, for the general community, you know, engaging uh, um, public figures, you know, um, um, popular pop stars, uh, football stars, whatever. I mean, you know, um, people uh, or figures that, that are trusted um, to, to really also uh, help carry the messages. But in general, I have to say, all of us have to still learn a lot in this area. Yes, yeah. well, obviously the agency is still uh, helping a lot. I have a question now from uh, David Byrne, who's a former EU Commissioner for Health, uh, Irish EU Commissioner for Health. And he thanks you for your interesting remarks and also for the work of the ECDC uh, in this, during this pandemic. And he asks, uh, following our recent experience with rapid alert on this coronavirus, do you think there's a need for a review or even replacement of the international health regulations? If so, what fundamentals are necessary? Um, I mean, that's, uh, I, I believe that the international health regulations are sufficient, but they're not implemented. Ah. So it's more a matter of really implementing this everywhere and not only sort of uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a paper at the national level, but really as, as um, a, a, a life exercise down to the local level. Because what we have seen is that uh, there are sometimes national plans and national exercises and these kind of things. But the local level, that is the first line first ones that deal with these outbreaks, they're often not as well prepared. And that I think is uh, for me also a uh, focus area for when, when we are now looking at improving uh, the preparedness status. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's something to be, uh, to remember. I have a question from um, a member of the press, Orla Ryan from the journal, and she has a number of uh, fairly practical and specific questions. Um, uh, she asks questions about your view on antigen testing, uh, what, the value of that uh, for people to use at home, uh, the uh, importance of contact tracing, uh, should countries have undertaken this uh, very much earlier. Uh, she has a question about a topic that's very much, of course, in the uh, news and uh, interest at the moment, uh, blood clotting. Um, and, and should people uh, take this uh, vaccine who have blood clots um, and um, mandatory hotel quarantine? Are all of these of use, uh, the values of these in combating the disease? Uh, what is the agency and, and your view in, in terms of stopping um, COVID-19, uh, the various measures that have been undertaken and the successor otherwise? So what we have said, uh, basically it's kind of a mantra since, um, since a year that uh, what needs to be done is uh, put um, a good um, surveillance in place, test, and trace. So contact tracing is an essential element of uh, uh, controlling uh, the, the, the spread. And the rigorous contact tracing is also something uh, besides the, the um, um, face mask using 
that these Asian countries that have fairly well controlled the outbreak have been implementing. They have invested massively in contact tracing. So, so that is something that we, that we still think is necessary and that will be necessary throughout, regardless of whether we are in a wave or whether we are in a, a localized outbreak situation. Uh, contact tracing will be a key tool uh, for for um, controlling and 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 um, uh, reducing the spread. Now the antigen test uh, we have uh, put out guidance. Uh, the the um, uh, of course it's very good that someone um, can do the test. Um, there is of course a a, um, a necessity that if the test turns out positive that uh, there is a, a recourse where these people can, can turn to uh, for, for further support, uh, that there's clear what kind of uh, behavior they, they, they should uh, now um, uh, adopt. And it's important that um, uh, some sort of follow-up is done so that these um, uh, cases are not lost to the, to the, to the general surveillance. So that is something that is still um, uh, the, the modalities are um, uh, still under discussion, but I think that is something that needs to be ensured. Uh, regarding the mand mandatory hotel quarantine, um, uh, that is uh, something as uh, uh, countries have introduced as measure for travelers. Um, and um, uh, there it really depends on what situation, epidemiological situation is in the country, um, how um, um, big the contribution of such measures to the control of the spread in the country it will be. Because nonetheless, even if the people come out of this quarantine, they still have to follow all the measures in the country not to, 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 to get um, uh, infected. And regarding the, the side effects uh, with, the, with the blood clotting, I mean, here, this is not our expertise. expertise. We do not have the information that our colleagues of the medicines agency have. So they are right now examining all these cases. And I know that their committee, they have given already opinions, but they are a sort of um, under constant review uh, with, uh, with those cases. Thank you indeed for that, that very, very specific and, and comprehensive advice. Uh, our Director General in the Institute, Michael Collins, uh, has a question. Um, and he asks, has Brexit complicated the work of the agency? And what is the level of cooperation currently with the UK? So, um, uh, yeah, of course, it has complicated things. Um, uh, that's the bottom line. But I mean, there are also, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, measures taken. For instance, the European Commission has granted the UK uh, access to the European early warning uh, and response system. So the UK is still able to access all the messages from the member states and uh, give their own um, uh, messages. And we are currently um, in... Um, uh, negotiation um, with and discussion with uh, the Public Health England um, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, how we can set up a future collaboration. That's yes, that's that's useful. Could I just add an, uh, an add on to that, uh, Dr. Aman? Uh, cooperation. I mean, there are a great many tensions internationally at the moment uh, between Russia and China and the West uh, and other countries. Do you find you have good cooperation on a technical level with the viral agencies in these countries? I know you mentioned you had widespread cooperation uh, with the agencies and you have the, the new Africa um, uh, agreement in 2020, but do, are you satisfied that from a technical medical level you are getting cooperation across across the globe? Um, I mean, uh, as I said, we have not um, uh, no co not cooperation with every country in the world, um, uh, but uh, 
that I mentioned, and especially also with China, which was very relevant here in this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, in particular at the beginning, um, we have already a, a collaboration agreement since uh, more than 10 years. Um, it was, uh, I think the colleagues, the technical colleagues there gave us the information they had available. I, uh, for me, it's not possible to assess whether they had all the information available. But I have, I'm confident that what they had available, they made um, uh, uh, accessible for us. That's, thank you, that's useful. Um, uh, Peter Houlihan is asking, um, due to COVID lockdown and virus fatigue, are member states in danger of repeated lockdowns for the foreseeable future? What is your, your crystal ball view? Well, I, I um, have lost my crystal ball, um, <laughs> but I, I, um, I believe uh, that after the first wave um, last spring and during, uh, during the summer where we had really low case numbers, countries um, got a bit too enthusiastic and they paid a high price with, uh, with a much higher second wave. Uh, and now some countries are already entering a third wave. But I have the feeling they have learned uh, that this virus is not to um, be trifled with. So we have to um, um, uh, be very, very um, prudent in uh, easing measures and um, uh, so that we can actually avoid to have uh, to strengthen them again. That is not a hundred percent guarantee, of course, because uh, I mean the variants can still occur and we never know what kind of um, uh, capacities they have, the new, if there are new ones. Uh, but what we will do now, and I think it will come out next week, is uh, basically a toolbox for member states where they can give their parameters of the current situation and then see what is the, the range of options that they, that they um, can, um, can have. Um, uh, uh, employ either to go to a lower level of epidemic in, uh, uh, situation and what is it that they have to employ when they go to a higher level of the epidemic in, uh, situation so that they can have this a bit more I mean, it will not be standardized in the, in the sense that everybody in uh, Europe does everything at the same time in the same way, but at least that the range of measures is the same across the EU. We will have to see how, how well this is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, accepted, but uh, when we um, introduced this a month ago to uh, the concept to the member states, they were very interested in this. That's right. You mentioned um, surveillance and, and digital uh, as being absolutely vital, the digital tools being absolutely vital. Uh, are we approaching some sort of um, uh, level in the EU where everybody will be uh, able to contribute uh, in an even way towards uh, surveillance information? Or is the situation uh, uh, very different between countries, because this seems to be an absolutely vital tool in monitoring um, pandemics for the future. I think we still have long ways to go with this. Um, uh, and some countries are further ahead than others. And here, uh, contrary to some other situations, the smaller countries have an advantage because of course they can uh, roll out things in a, in a more standardized way more quickly. But um, uh, that's what, what we are trying to do now to, to really see um, with those countries that are willing to participate, how can we use uh, what is available already? What are the obstacles? So what do we have to overcome in order to make this useful? So uh, it's, it, it will be a process and it will not go quickly. Uh, so don't expect anything, uh, let's say by the end of next year that it's already fully, fully fledged um, um, uh, available. But um, we, we have to move towards this. Yeah. 
Uh, in that context, um, Dr. Arman, how quickly do you feel the new proposed um, expansion of, of um, legislation for the agency will be passed? Uh, I wish I knew. Uh, I know the time frame for the parliament, they will vote in June, I think, in the plenary. Uh, but then it's still the council and uh, they haven't committed yet to a time frame. I mean, for me, of course, it would be rather sooner than later, uh, but uh, I don't have the final, the final verdict. Yes, because it would seem an important issue to move forward. Um, another question then, a press question from Kate McCurry, she's the Press Association of Belfast, and I suppose one of, of great interest to the population. Can Dr. Amon say when she believes European travel will reopen among member states? Well, that's another crystal ball question. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I can. I, I, I cannot say when. It depends on what you mean by uh, reopen. Uh, reopen in the way as we were in 2019. That will still take some time. Uh, reopen in a way that is um, uh, maybe um, without uh, without uh, uh, all these uh, restrictions. That will depend on how quickly we can roll out the. Um, the vaccinations and how effective the vaccine protection is in the longer run. Thank you, thank you. And um, Alex Conway from the IIA asks, um, does Dr. Amman have any insights or comments on the Dutch government's recent experiments on safely facilitating large gatherings like festival? Uh, are they realistic or do they pose a risk to public health uh, and the spread? It's a question about uh, trying to get large gatherings safely. Uh, do you have any ad advice on how that might safely be done? We have not yet um, 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 assessed uh, that experiment um, and understand that there are um, um, uh, efforts and wishes, uh, desires to bring these big gatherings together. But I mean, we should keep in mind as long as a large part of the uh, population is not protected, they always, that this always bears a high risk. Yes, yes. I, I think that's uh, a good warning. And Hannah Deasy from the Institute asks, um, what overall uh, timeline would you foresee for the pandemic? Perhaps five years? Uh, will it be with us? Is it a type of influenza, but more serious? Have you any um, vision of perhaps how long it might, it might be around? Well, we don't have, of course, uh, a timeline yet, but um, we are working right now um, on scenarios, how the kind of end stage could look like. And there are, of course, more favorable and more disastrous scenarios. And uh, so we will start discussing these with our stakeholders, our expert colleagues in the member states, and then also discuss with them um, what we could do now and should do now, today, uh, to move to a favorable scenario. Because I think, although the measures probably will not be different than what we are saying right now, it might also help in the communication that we say, look, this is the scenario where we get to. Now, the scenarios range from there is no uh, SARS-CoV around anymore, Second, it's endemic, but controlled by a high level of vaccination with a good effectiveness so that we have to deal with uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, smaller outbreaks. Then the third scenario is a situation more like what we have right now, where it's going up and down in different countries and lockdown and uh, vaccine coverage uh, for whatever reasons may not be sufficient to actually bring it down. And the fourth scenario is the catastrophic scenario where we say, well, nothing works anymore, nobody cares anymore, and the virus is rampaging, which I don't think is likely. <laughs> I, 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 to be very honest, I, it, I don't think it's likely. <clears throat> Um, and uh, I mean, the most, for me, the most likely scenario will be the second scenario where it's endemic, 
where we have it uh, around, uh, but with a high level of vaccination, um, with a good uh, effectiveness of this vaccination, um, uh, of these vaccines, uh, we, we can maintain uh, a, a, normal, a normal life. That's my, 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 my uh, sort of That's your, your vision. Yes. Well, I think as we have reached our time limit, Dr. Amman, that's a very good uh, vision, I think, on which to end uh, an extraordinarily interesting talk. And on behalf of everybody, I really want to thank you for what you have shared with us. And in particular, we would like to wish you and the agency um, um, the very best uh, uh, good wishes going forward uh, in your work and to thank you on behalf of, of uh, all Europeans for what you are providing for us and will continue to provide. Uh, so once again, thank you so much uh, for being okay. with us today. It was a pleasure for me and uh, thank you for all the interesting questions.